So if people are feeling bored, unmotivated, unstimulated, most of the time it's because they are overindulging in mm. things that keep pounding this dopamine system, but the, but the baseline of dopamine is going down, 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 down. Dopamine is often called your feel-good hormone, your reward chemical, or your motivation hormone. It plays a key role in creating that winning feeling you get when you achieve a goal or have a novel experience. When you're constantly pursuing things, eating highly palatable foods, engaging in very stimulating anything, any behavior that's very stimulating, there's a drop below baseline and it takes an increasingly great stimulus, high threshold stimulus in order to excite you. Dopamine deficiencies are associated with multiple physical and mental disorders, including symptoms of reactive depression and clinical depression. It can also contribute to more permanent and severe health conditions, including Parkinson's disease. You know, addiction is a progressive narrowing of the things that bring you pleasure. And if I may, enlightenment is a progressive expansion of the things that bring you pleasure. Right. All of that hinges on this dopamine system. Dopamine detoxing involves abstaining from overstimulating activities, such as playing video games and eating junk food. Proponents claim this can help the brain's dopamine receptors reset. There are also three hacks that Andrew Huberman talks about in order to reset and reinvigorate the way your brain supplies you dopamine. So according to Huberman, what are these hacks? There are a few hacks that can actually help and Anna talks about some of these in, in her book. The main thing is to, if you are, if someone is engaging in any truly addictive behavior or substance or a behavior that just doesn't feel like it's that great, but you're finding yourself doing it compulsively. Mm -hmm. Like, wow, what are some examples? Texting, today? Instagram. I limit my Instagram time to two hours per day, which itself just sounds like a lot. So this guy, who is a real story, uh, was struggling in a major way. So about three months ago, he was watching a lot of videos online. He was texting a lot. He was mainly playing video games. Video games, video games, video games. But he wasn't really enjoying them as much mm. anymore. And one thing you see with people with ADHD is they actually can focus if they're really interested in something. Right. Why? Because their dopamine levels are elevated and they're able to focus. He heard about the dopamine system and Anna's work and I talked to him and he decided to do what some people call a dopamine fast, but for him that meant no video games and he did two weeks of no screens which at first I think was agonizing for him. Oh my gosh. It's now three months later, I'd say a little less than three months later. I actually talked to his parent today, working full time, off all ADHD meds. Hmm. Has a girlfriend, I don't know if that's related or not, probably because he's got his life together a little bit more, which is an yeah. attractive feature as opposed to someone who's you know spiraling out, doing nothing, living at home, which frankly is an unattractive feature, regardless of you know boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever. Yeah. He's very focused on his work, he's excited by things, and he allows himself a short period of time each day where he plays video games and he enjoys them again like never before. Mm. There is a simple explanation for this, which is that his dopamine system is reset. If you allow yourself four hours a day on social media, you'll probably find that you're looking for a jolt of dopamine that you won't be able to find. This is due to your overuse of these apps and platforms, trying to subconsciously ring that Pavlovian bell. Andrew Huberman recommends to combat these effects by taking digital detoxes. This is akin to withdrawal periods for substance abuse, allowing the brain to reset and rediscover pleasure in other activities. Such breaks can help mitigate the overpowering grip of social media on the brain's dopamine-driven reward pathways, promoting a healthier balance of pleasure and engagement. This drugified social interaction exploits the brain's reward pathways, making users susceptible to compulsive overconsumption. The novelty factor also plays a crucial role. Dopamine is activated by novel stimuli, prompting the brain to pay attention to new information. Social media platforms, powered by artificial intelligence, constantly provide novel content tailored to users' preferences, ensuring continuous engagement. This incessant stream of new, personalized content keeps the brain in a perpetual state of anticipation and reward, similar to the mechanisms underlying gambling addiction. So you have to be very judicious in your interactions with things that deliver pleasure, or else they will soon not deliver pleasure, and they will diminish your pleasure for everything else that you mm -hmm. interact with. 
Yeah, on the time scale of 24 hours, one of the, the huge mistakes that we all make, and I'm, I've said this many times, so if, uh, if people have heard me say this before, forgive me, but it turns out it's still true. Uh, getting too much bright light exposure from the hours of 10 p.m. until 4 a.m. That bright light exposure between 10 p.m. and 4 a.m., even if you adjust the colors of the lights, you still need to get everything really, really dim because it actually blocks the release of dopamine through a pathway that involves a structure called the habenula. The habenula was a kind of cryptic structure in the brain for a long time, but now we know there's a punishment signal in the brain. You get neurochemically punished for viewing bright light at those hours. The habenula, a small structure in the brain, plays a crucial role in regulating dopamine, often referred to as the feel-good neurotransmitter. The habenula is sometimes called the disappointment nucleus because it becomes highly active when expectations are not met. This activation suppresses dopamine production, reinforcing feelings of disappointment and negative reinforcement. Recent research highlights the habenula's response to light exposure, particularly artificial light during late hours. Studies by the Chronobiology Unit at the National Institutes of Mental Health and researchers at Brown University demonstrate that bright light exposure between 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. can significantly impact the habenula. This exposure triggers a depressive pathway, leading to a suppression of dopamine. The consequences of this suppression include learning deficits, mood disturbances, and dysregulation of blood sugar levels due to impaired pancreatic function. To mitigate the negative effects of late night light exposure on the habenula and dopamine regulation, adopting a strategic light management plan is essential. One effective approach is aligning light exposure with the body's natural circadian rhythms. Uh, firelight won't do that. Moonlight's fine. Candles, lights that are dim so or low in your we environment. how develop that? So the, the, the pathway to the habenula and then to these dopamine reducing circuits are the pain pathway that we were referring to earlier. It's a generic pathway through which lots of different types of signals and stimuli and events can punish us internally. Start by maximizing exposure to natural light early in the day. Spend at least 30 minutes outside in the morning sunlight, which helps set the circadian clock and boosts early cortisol production, promoting alertness. Throughout the day, ensure regular exposure to natural light to maintain a stable circadian rhythm. In the evening, minimize exposure to artificial light, especially blue light from screens. Use dim, warm lighting after sunset to signal to the brain that it's time to wind down. Implement a digital curfew by avoiding screens at least one hour before bedtime. Using blue light blocking glasses can also help if screen use is unavoidable. You know, what should people do? Well, certainly I'm trying this now and I have some good examples. Right, so we have circuitry in the brain related to the so-called basal ganglia and we have go sort of activating, you know, think gas pedal, and then we have, there's a lot of no-go circuitry. And learning how to keep that no-go, don't circuitry, as we could call it, uh, tuned up is very important. We have in our brain a set of neural circuits that fall under the umbrella term of the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia are involved in action execution, meaning doing certain things, and action suppression, meaning not doing certain things. And so many times throughout the day, but I try and get 25 a day, where I actively refrain from doing something that I impulsively want to do. Could be looking at my phone, but it could even be something trivial. Like I wanna to walk to the kitchen and get a glass of water. So I'm actively engaging in action-based denial. So restricting my behavior in some way as a way of keeping these dopamine circuits tuned up. I'm actually trying a, an odd experiment, which is for the first hour of every day, no phone. Also not looking at my phone first thing in the morning for an hour, because knowing what we now know about the second phase of sleep and REM sleep being more predominant, the second wave of sleep and the fact that you're working through a lot of emotional and logistical contingencies, you're reshaping your brain in sleep. That's when neuroplasticity occurs, during sleep. When you wake up in the morning, you are in a perfect position to process all of the work that your neural circuitry has been doing the night before. But if you immediately go to a sensory experience, especially a rich sensory experience of social media posts scrolling by, you're actually missing the information that you process that night. And even more importantly, that second half of the night during REM sleep is when the emotional weight of experiences become sorted and can emotionally register. 
This is due to the second half of sleep being when you relive these experiences, even though your body is not secreting adrenaline. It can be looked at as an internal form of therapy or even trauma therapy. And that is why people who don't get that sleep are very easily agitated and can feel like the world is crashing down on them. So when I wake up in the morning, I want to receive ideas that I want to learn from my learning. And if you take in new information, you are not in a position to do that. Now there's some other hacks that mm -hmm. um, Anna's talked about. There's a beautiful study published in the European Journal of Physiology showing that getting into cold water for anywhere from three to six minutes creates a 2.5x increase in dopamine that lasts many hours. So it's a unique stimulus because it's not like a spike and then it drops. It's like a long arc increasing your baseline dopamine, increases alertness, feelings of well-being. Deliberate cold exposure triggers a surge in dopamine release in the brain and body, eliciting feelings of euphoria and well-being. Despite the initial discomfort associated with cold immersion, Individuals often report a profound sense of satisfaction and mental clarity following exposure. This elevation in dopamine levels contributes to enhanced mood and cognitive function, promoting a state of heightened alertness and focus. The interplay between dopamine and other neurotransmitters, such as norepinephrine and adrenaline, highlights the multifaceted effects of cold water exposure. The release of norepinephrine and adrenaline amplifies the physiological stress response, further stimulating dopamine production. This not only primes the body for adaptive stress coping, but also reinforces the pleasurable sensations associated with cold immersion. The sustained elevation of dopamine following cold water exposure also holds implications for long-term well-being. Chronic engagement in deliberate cold exposure may lead to neuroplastic changes, shaping the brain's reward circuitry and resilience to stress. By harnessing the power of dopamine modulation, individuals can cultivate a greater capacity for emotional regulation and mental resilience in the face of adversity. This link between dopamine and metabolic processes highlights the interconnectedness of physiological systems. While the primary focus of cold water exposure may lie in dopamine-mediated mood enhancement, its secondary effects on metabolism and hormonal regulation is quite astounding. The potential modulation of testosterone levels through dopamine pathways presents an intriguing avenue for further exploration, offering insights into the broader implications of cold immersion practices on hormonal health. And there are some cases of people who were full-blown addicts or people who are struggling with ADHD who start doing regular cold water exposure, you know, three to six times a week, three to six minutes at a time, and discover that, wow, they actually can focus because they're getting that dopamine. Wow. Yeah. Um, dopamine was always thought of as pleasure, but it's, it's confusing because it's, it's associated with pleasure, but it's not the actual experience of pleasure. Mm -hmm. And immediately after sex, immediately after any powerful ex experience that's very pleasurable, dopamine system crashes Cross. down. Yeah. The, the problem is not pleasures. The problem is that pleasure experienced without prior requirement for pursuit yes. is terrible for us. It's terrible for us as individuals, it's terrible for us as, as groups, and I, I have great confidence in the human species to work this out, but we are finding now, and we are going to increasingly find, that those who will be successful, young or old, are going to be those people who can create their own internal buffers. They're going to be able to control their relationship to pleasures because the proximity to pleasures and the availability is the problem.